morning and welcome to Rising. We've got another great show for you today. A lot of news happening in the nation's capital. Why don't you take it away, Jess? Lots and lots of news and lots of traffic because Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu landed in Washington Tuesday to less than a warm welcome. Pro-Palestine protesters staged a sit-in Tuesday afternoon to protest his visit. Yeah, the prompter is on strong. Demonstrators occupied the rotunda in the Cannon House office building on Capitol Hill. And though they were peaceful, Capitol Police arrested several people because demonstrations are not allowed in congressional buildings. Now, demonstrations sprouted outside the Watergate Hotel, too, where Netanyahu is staying. Law enforcement is leaving no stone unturned. Barricades have been erected around the Watergate hotels for days. The entire D.C. police force has been called on. Even the NYPD are helping, sending reinforcements. Back on Capitol Hill, Dem Democrats are divided on whether to attend Netanyahu's speech Wednesday afternoon. According to several reports, nearly 100 Democrats from both the Senate and the House are expected to skip Bibi's address. No, I'm not. Uh, I, I personally uh, will be there when uh, world leaders come to the people's chamber. Uh, it's important that we uh, hear their perspective. Kamala Harris will also skip the speech, her office citing a scheduling conflict there. Netanyahu is set to meet President Biden and Harris after Congress. And of course, he will head to Mar-a-Lago Friday, Netanyahu will, to meet with Trump. In a Truth Social post, Trump wrote, Looking forward to welcoming Bibi Netanyahu at Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida, Trump wrote on Truth Social. During my first term, we had peace and stability in the region, even signing the historic Abraham Accords, and we will have it again. Here to discuss all of this is White House columnist for The Hill, Niall Stanage. Welcome, Niall. So, Niall, what can we expect? Is Netanyahu going to get arrested in the United States? I heard there's a warrant out for him. I don't know that he's going to get arrested just yet. I mean, the ICC is seeking an arrest warrant for him. That process has to go through. There are people who have suggested making some kind of citizen arrest, but I think it's unlikely to end up that way. And Speaker Johnson is uh, threatening arrests from the other perspective, in other words, threatening to arrest people on the House floor if there are any disruptions there. So for the last several days, there was some confusion as to whether Biden was going to meet with Netanyahu, whether he was available to do so, led to speculation that, like, what is going on with him? Is he ill? Um, is it just that he's maybe feeling humiliated after what he's gone through over the last few days, um, whether Harris declining to preside over the Congress proceeding uh, for Netanyahu's visit. Um, should people be reading into that, that it's a snubbing of Netanyahu and it's an effort by Harris, who's now running a campaign for presidency, to, uh, to signal to her base, her more anti-Israel base, that don't, don't be upset with me. I, I'm hearing you. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't want protests against, I don't want genocide Joe kind of rhetoric lobbed at me. You know, anytime a politician cites prior commitments for not doing something, I think you always automatically raise an eyebrow about that or view it with some skepticism. Uh, Vice President Harris could have cancelled uh, this engagement in Indiana if she wanted to. But I, I, I think that really the issue is she doesn't particularly want the visual of being behind uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who legitimately is seen by a lot of Democrats as a war criminal or certainly an extremely right-wing figure. And to have her behind him while Republicans uh, applaud his speech is not the political optics that she wants. Now, this isn't always the case with how the foreign policy establishment works in Washington, but we're getting a lot of information from staffers. We had former staffers that resigned over Gaza saying they believe a Harris administration would be better than what we're getting from Biden. We also have a lot of staffers writing to their bosses in Congress saying, we want you to protest, we don't want you to go. What do you make of near 100 congressional Democrats refusing to go? I think it is significant. I think it looks like this is going to be way beyond the last time there was a Democratic boycott of Netanyahu. 
which was back in 2015. Uh, to make a very long story short, he kind of stuck his oar in when Obama was trying to negotiate a nuclear deal with Iran, and Democrats took exception to that. I think the, the visceral impact of what is happening in Gaza makes it even more likely that more Democrats will stay out of this. And I do think that your point is well made, Jess, about the staffers. I mean, we see not only support for protest, but we've seen people resign from the State Department and so forth in protest at the president's policies on Gaza. Do we have any idea how Kamala Harris would handle this issue differently from Joe Biden? I'm seeing some maybe aspiration on from progressives that she is going to be a little bit tougher on Israel than Joe Biden has been. I myself am skeptical of that because she does actually have ties to um, Israeli leadership, if not Netanyahu himself. Um, uh, also, in, you know, her her husband is Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, not that that necessarily means she'll be pro-Israel or pro-Netanyahu, but um, I think it's a little bit of wishful thinking, but we don't know. Do you have any inclination of whether it'll be different at all? I think there are people who want it to be different, but I think you have to squint pretty hard at her past positions to see real difference. It is true that she rhetorically seems to have made uh, a greater acknowledgement of the suffering of the Palestinians. There has been the implication at times that she's more inclined to call for a ceasefire than Biden was, that she's maybe a little bit less comfortable with this language of uh, ironclad support for Israel from the United States. But I don't think progressives should assume that this is going to be a sort of a, a free Gaza or free Palestine presidency if she were to be elected. Now, it's, it's strange to me that we have a foreign leader coming, making a stop at the former president's residence, meeting with him. Of course, he's a, a front-running presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. It does seem weird to me. It seems like it's more so about their alignment of the global right than anything else. What do you make of him going to Mar-a-Lago? One of the things I'd say about that, Jess, is that the personal relationship between Netanyahu and Trump is kind of weird because on one hand, Trump is very, very pro-Israel, you know, moved the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, had this quote-unquote peace plan that was so pro-Israel that the Palestinian Authority, a fairly comparatively moderate group, sort of, you know, just refused at point blank within a few hours. But Trump has a real objection to the fact that Netanyahu quite promptly recognized Biden's victory in 2020, and their personal relationship has never really recovered from that. So I think it's largely about repairing those personal fences, and from Netanyahu's perspective, doing so with the expectation that obviously Trump could win in November. Yeah, Trump has also been kind of vague about uh, what his views of what's happening in, in Israel are, uh, you know, allowing, with, with the understanding that, yes, he's been a very pro-Israel uh, president, moving the embassy, uh, et cetera, and that, you know, many of his conservative supporters are, and including his vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance, are wholly and fully on board with um, the Israeli effort to defeat uh, Hamas. But Trump hasn't talked about it very much, and I think knows that it is, it is dividing his opposition a little bit because there's so much dissatisfaction from progressives on what Biden is doing. He has been conspicuously quiet about it, maybe allowing people to project whatever they would prefer his policy to be onto him. Yeah, I think that's true to a degree. The other thing about Trump, and whether this is a good or a bad thing, is a different conversation, but he's so focused on the visuals of things and how they appear. I, I don't have the exact quote locked in my mind, but he said something to the effect that Israel has handled the PR side of it very badly, or the visuals of it have been very bad for Israel. Now, it's not quite clear whether he means and therefore they should stop, or whether he just means they shouldn't allow, you know, footage of destruction and devastation in Gaza to be shown. And we're at a point where there's divided support for Israel in the United States, but also divided support for Netanyahu back home, even right. within his own administration and the highest levels of government. He's also had a lot of struggles with foreign ties and trade relations. You have Colombia refusing to give them coal, which they greatly depend on for energy there in Israel, and also a depletion of weapons resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so is Netanyahu coming here to to beg? What, what does Bibi get out of this trip? I think he's trying to solidify this idea of U.S. support for Israel. But you're right. I mean, there's real question marks over that support in a whole lot of ways. You know, Democrats, some Democrats, I should say, wanting the Biden administration to pause weapons completely. All the other um, sort of U.S. civic society pressures on him. And the point that you make about Israel and about the hostage families is really important. Just a couple of days ago, I was down at the White House on some um, 
families of American citizens who were held hostage were, were speaking to reporters. And they were, at least by implication, quite critical of Netanyahu because there is this sense among some but not all of the hostage families that he is kind of torpedoing a deal that would bring about a ceasefire and the release of hostages for his own political gain and for his own political survival in Israel. And that's a, an underrated uh, element of importance in all this. Speaking of uh, policy, based on this visit, is there any hope that we could see movement on a deal to release um, a hostages, to bring hostilities to an end? Is there going to be a diplomatic outcome here, or is this really just rah-rah, celebrate Netanyahu, show solidarity, that type of thing? Normally, as you well know, when a foreign leader comes for these kind of visits, it is typically to announce or unveil some major change. Maybe Netanyahu will surprise us and do that, but there isn't a whole lot of sign of it so far. He is uh, purportedly sending an Israeli team to uh, continue these negotiations on Thursday. But, I mean, I think there's always been an enormous question about whether Netanyahu himself really does back this proposal that the Biden administration keeps insisting is an Israeli yeah. proposal. Thanks so much for coming on, Niall. It's always good to get your insight as you witness all these historical events firsthand. Thank you for traveling around for the Hill. And we've got more rising after this.